Sea of Red, it's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. Well, the big win streak is over, and as always, I'm Dan alongside Matt to talk about it. Matt, we knew this was inevitable, right? The Calgary Flames would lose at some point in regulation, and it's come. Yeah, and, it, you know, credit to the Flames that uh, it took till the seventh game for them to have that happen, but, you know, it, it's been a fairly good month for the team. Every year, this team seems to get one six-game winning streak. Can you imagine if that's it? Like, we're done. We've expended it. Yep. And finished. That's right. Bottom um, five finished. Here we come. And, you know, no, of course not. But, you know, it, it just... It's a, it was a heck of a way to start, right? I mean, last week, this week, it, it's been fun to watch. Yes. And it, it's nice to see them finding ways to win. The find-away flames, as Derek Wills used to like to call them. Well, they found a way to win in the first game this week. The Calgary Flames, the Pittsburgh Penguins played uh, in the South Dome. This is a three-game homestand this week. Calgary ended up winning 4-3 to three in a shootout. Um, quite the shootout in this one. I think they went, what, six rounds, which is quite a long shootout. Uh, and uh, Caudry tied it with 43 seconds left in the third for Calgary. That was a that was a fun game to watch. Th- this was a very bizarre game. And like it, it kind of shows you how bad Pittsburgh actually is. Because for most of the game, I do not feel that the Flames did anything right. And, like, all three of their goals in regulation kind of came out of nowhere. Um, like, there was no, like, build up of, like, oh, they have a ton of pressure and then they scored. It was was pretty much like, oh, and the puck's in the net. And it just seemed a little disjointed. Uh, like, especially in the second period, like, the Flames were terrible in the second uh, like they couldn't even string passes together, but they did manage to find a way to get it to overtime and then the shootout, which um, a huge credit to Dustin Wolf for keeping this team in it. Yeah, I think that's really what this one comes down to. Like you said, the Flames didn't look all that good. I think also the veterans, like, you know, Kadri tying it up like this. This was one of those games to me where the veterans looked like the veterans. And that's what you need from a, a, a team like the Flames that are rebuilding, right? You need your veterans to be able to come in and bail you out when you need that. Yeah, and then they buckled down when it mattered. Um, but, like, even the goals themselves were a bit weird. Like, Kirkland uh, trying to pass it to Anderson, but it, like, falling off of a stick and nobody being able to get it until he jumps on it in the right in front of the goalie. Like, it, it, the goal with, like, 43 seconds left. Like, and it... All of the goals were kind of just a little bit of like weirdness instead of your typical like set plays being set up properly. Um, just an odd game. And you know what I mean? Over an 82 game season, you're going to get games like this. And in the end, two points, two points, doesn't matter how you get them. So, you know, good. The Flames got the, the two points. And, you know, if we're going to give up a point, sure, let's give it up to the East. Like, you know, that was kind of the, we got the two points. We gave up the two, with the one point to the East. Nothing wrong with that. I thought, it, you know, they found a way to win, which is what they need to be doing. Yeah. And Dustin Wolf can always say that he stopped Crosby and Malkin in a shootout and got a win. Yeah, you know, that that's a nice feather to put in your hat. It's fun to see these young guys now coming in. Like you know, you're old when the young guys were watching you as a kid. Yes, <laughs> but yeah, that'll probably be something that Dustin Wolf will remember forever. Mm-hmm. And uh, again, Grady has that moment, right? Oh, for sure. Well, uh, and it was nice to see him, like once again, facing thirty plus shots and looking solid against every one of them, and very focused and controlled in that. Doesn't look like a rookie. Um, the Calgary Flames went on on Thursday to play against the Carolina Hurricanes. You and I were talking before we hit record. I really like the Hurricanes wearing the red helmets on the road. I think it's a sharp look. But what wasn't sharp was uh, the Flames in this one. Uh, the Flames ended up losing 4-2 to two to the Carolina Hurricanes here. And, you know, going into this week, the Flames at the end of this week, this game and the next one we'll talk about, taking on two of the best teams in the league or the teams coming into the season that should be the best. So it was really interesting to see how the Flames matched up with this team, how they matched up with such a good team. Um, definitely got outshot by the Hurricanes, but do you think they got outplayed? Uh, for the first, like, 25 minutes, I-, I felt that the Flames were virtually asleep at the wheel. And got bailed out by Vladar by and large until that point. And 
Like once it got down to three nothing, it, then it's like, oh, we actually have to play hockey now. And they once again tried to battle back. They brought it to within a single goal, but it wasn't quite enough. And the Hurricanes were able to hold on. And it's never a recipe for success being, you know, having your head stoved in um, and, you know, getting down three nothing. Like, you're not going to win very often in those kind of games. Yeah, I think the Flames were lucky that they were able to, you know, come back from that 3 nothing and get something on the board, get the two they did. You're right, that first 25 minutes, they didn't look great. And I was in the Dome watching this one, and I thought to myself, this looks almost like a slow team versus a really fast team. And the Flames were getting buzzed by all night. I mean, you know, for years, part of the identity of the Carolina Hurricanes, kind of that European-style fast play. And it just felt like the Flames didn't know what to do in some cases when these guys were zooming by them. Yeah, and it took a while for them to settle down. But like once they actually got their game going, they were able to dictate the play. It's just they needed to do that from the opening puck drop instead of, you know, when you're down 3 nothing. Exactly, yeah. And 39 saves for Vidar here. Like, you know, this was really a, a goaltending game for the flames without the goalie it would have been a lot worse yeah and to the flames credit they have been very effective at keeping most of the shots to the periphery like you're not seeing a ton of great a like right in front of the net scoring chances but the shot volume is a little concerning it is and i mean you know carolina too is able to score from the blue line and we saw it a couple times here too where you know they i think there was a few times one of them uh one of our players was screening the dar but I think too often they were letting that puck go back to the dangerous blue line for her, for uh, the Hurricanes. Mm-hmm. And then we had Hockey Night in Canada on Saturday. The Calgary Flames take on the undefeated Winnipeg Jets. Um, Jets extended their winning streak to eight with a 5-3 win over the Flames. I guess the question is how much you want to talk about officiating this one. But, um, you know, again, the Flames taking on a good team in the league. What were your what was your thoughts on well, this? Well, for the first 53 minutes I thought it was a good toe-to-toe battle. Uh, I thought that like the Jets had the better end in the first period. Um certainly on the shot clock, but uh, I thought like the play was about 55-45 where Calgary was a little bit worse than them but not too far. I feel that the script was flipped in the second and third period uh up until the 7 minutes remaining. Um it was a 3-3 game. Uh, I thought it was a very even game between the two teams, and then the referees decided to call the game for Winnipeg. Yeah, I was. I I don't like to blame games on officiating, but this is one that I don't think you can go any other way with it. No, like it, you look at like Zari getting high sticked in front of the net and cross checked in front of the net. None, neither of those plays were called. Then, like, 30 seconds later, we get two penalties on hits, both called tripping, which, like, they were standard body checks, and then Kadri getting a slash when he hit the guy's stick. And he didn't break the guy's stick, he just tapped his stick. You know, like, it, it, it's one of those where, like, if you're if that's the standard that you're calling, there's going to be about 400 penalties in the game. It, you know, and you're going to play the whole game three on three. Like, you know, like it, it's one of those where, like, I do not understand at all where you're getting those penalties from. And, it, you know, it very much felt like, okay, well, we don't want this game going to overtime because it's hockey night in Canada. So we'll just give one side as many penalties as they can until they score. And, you know. It, yeah, yeah. I don't know. What do you think about Kadri's behavior? Justified? Uh, honestly, um, I personally would have taken an unsportsmanlike conduct. So I thought he was actually calm and reserved. You would take an unsportsmanlike for yelling at the officials. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and I mean, okay, maybe in the moment when we look back at it, it could have been handled differently. To me, you want to see emotion from your players. You want to see emotion from your veterans. I mean, did he handle it the way he should have? Maybe, maybe not. But I'd rather see something like that when you know he's got emotion and passion. And that's what you want if this team is going to go deep. And, you know, to try and draw on that and that sort of thing. So, you know, it wasn't going to be the difference in the in the score of the game anyways. So I have no problem with yeah. it. Yeah. 
And it's good to see that like the players actually care and give a damn. Um, well, that's it. Seeing yeah. you know where it isn't a justified call, and being legitimately like, "Hey, you're screwing the game for no reason." Like you know, like it just. If this was a game that cost the Calgary Flames a playoff berth or something, I'd feel different. But in the end of the 82 game season, I don't think we're going to remember this. It's not going to amount to anything, you know, stats wise. So, yeah, I have no problem with it. Yeah. It's one of those, though, that the player, like, I'm sure that everybody in the room was quite livid. And it'll be interesting to see how they respond tomorrow in their next game against Vegas. Um, if they can, you know, feed off of that anger and frustration and, you know, so to speak, take it out on Vegas and, uh, you know, get the two points from them, or if they're going to regress even further in their play because like, oh, well, we can't win because even if we try, the refs are going to, you know, decide games in the other way. And, you yeah, know, it'll be interesting to see. With those three games, the Calgary Flames now sit third in the Pacific Division. After eight games played, they have five wins, two losses, and one overtime loss for a total of 11 points. Two teams above them, the LA Kings, who are at 5-2-2 two, and two for 12 points. And, of course, the Vegas Golden Knights, who played nine games, and they're at 6-2-1 and one for 13 points. So Calgary's still holding pretty strong. Vancouver below us, Seattle below us, Anaheim, of course, below us, San Jose below us, and I forgot one, also below us, the Edmonton Oilers. It's it's funny if you look. San Jose has two points. Then Edmonton is tied with Anaheim. Like this feels really good right now. Yes, and realistically, you know, like the Flames, it's not going to take very much for them. Like if they do struggle for them to fall down the standings into the like the zone where we feel like they should have from the start, or vice versa for Edmonton to quickly climb. Yes. Like realistically, like the Flames are are only four points up on being a bottom five team. Like that's not exactly a huge, you know, a, you know, mountain to climb for any of the bottom teams or for the Flames to fall down either. So, you know, it, it's it'll be interesting to see more or less uh, how things go over the next month or two. For sure. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, it's, it feels good now and we got to enjoy it while it's happening. Cause we know that this won't happen though. I am wondering if Edmonton fires their coach, who's left. Like it feels like they've gone through every possible coaching candidate at this point. Well, you know, I think that you have to go to like, uh, Connor McDavid's like, uh, Bantam level Dad. coach, you know, cause you're, you're starting to get into the weeds of like former coaches for McDavid. McDavid's first great English teacher comes in as the coach. Yep. <laughs> um, or his dad or something like that. I mean, there's nepotism there when Mr. McDavid comes in as the coach. Yep. But, uh, yeah, I mean, looking at the Flames standings, they've still got those points, and putting up the points early in the season is always important because we know they're going to get injuries. We know there's going to be some issues down the road. There is with every team. So having those points kind of banked early is really going to help these guys. Yep. And speaking of injuries, uh, Dan Vladar tweaked something in his start against the Hurricanes. Um, whether he's out for longer or shorter term, like, yes, he did back up uh, during the Winnipeg game, but uh, he might miss a start or two uh, that he normally would have just due to a minor hip tweak. I think as long as he's able to play in relief, they'll keep him, you know, they'll keep him dressed. But this is what I think we knew it would take for one guy to get a few more games. And now it's, I think it's going to be Wolf's game to run with. Yep. And, and and I feel very confident in that. If if Wolf is running with the starts for, you know, the next week, let's say, I have no problem with that. I agree wholeheartedly. And realistically, um, whether it's Wolf or Vladar getting a few extra starts here and there, like, you know, that Wolf's going to struggle at some point, even though he hasn't to this point, you know, you'll probably see Vladar getting a few extra starts at that point. Vladar being a little banged up, you let Wolf get a few extra. Yeah. And, and I think it'll go both ways. I think at some point, you know, Vladar will look bad at some point as well. And Wolf will get a few extras. Yep. So it's, it's going to go, yeah, it'll go both ways for these guys. Um, 
Matt, talking about this past week, it almost feels like the Flames, I don't know if their game regressed or they were just playing better teams, but they didn't look like the same team that we saw in the first week of the season. I don't know if they're kind of regressing the mean or if it is just better teams. What What's your read on that? Like they just, they didn't look great. And I think it was, I think it was very much exposed because there are two opponents late this week. Well, and in the first handful of games, you saw the Flames playing a very physical brand of hockey. Um, like, especially in the first four games, uh, they were more or less hitting anything that moved. And like you saw, especially with the Huberdo line with Mantha and Pospisil, uh, that the guys not named Huberdo were mucking it up basically on every shift. And now the last handful of games, the only guy that's been consistently delivering physically is uh, uh, Lomberg and everybody else has been playing a bit more passive. Um, it, it'll be interesting to see how they can make adjustments, uh, you know, and it, and in certain games, like it doesn't make sense to play a physical sent game, uh, like say against Carolina, because uh, they're, you know, very much a finesse team, but and you're going to have to catch them before you can get physical with them. Yeah, but like a game against Winnipeg, uh, for example, where the, like they're a big stocky team just like you are, you know, playing that more physical brand of hockey makes a lot more sense to try and eke out a win. And we didn't really see that uh, very much in that game. And I find that like when the Flames are engaged physically, they tend to just do better overall, even if they do lose the game. And we didn't really see much of that over the last four. Do you think, do you think this is the Flames regressing to where we know they're going to be? Uh, to an extent, like I think, uh, Pospisil specifically is in over his head as a center. Uh, um, and like you, you can see he's trying to do too much where like, um, last season, like his, he, his game was just basically let's muck it up and drive the corners um, as a winger and with him being the center, him focusing on the defensive side of things a little bit, like it, it's not his game um, to the same extent. And, you know, whether he learns how to play an effective game that way uh, sooner than later is yet to be seen, but he is struggling rather mightily and that is kind of bringing down the other two guys on his line because you know it, it's hard when one guy's not being effective yeah and and i don't think that i don't think that he should be a center i don't think that's where he's best used I mean, no. they're, sh they're short centers, and there's been some rumors this week the Flames are potentially looking to add a center. I mean, we can have that discussion another time, and it's going to be hard to do. But I, I also don't think he's the best option on the on the roster right now to fill that spot, but I just don't think that's the best use of possible. Well, it, and you see, like, um, heading back to last year, that, like, Kuzmenko, Sharon Govich, and Huberdo had very good chemistry together and were one of the better lines in the NHL when they were put together at the end of last season and Kuzmenko and Kadri, for whatever reason have never had any chemistry and that line has been very disjointed uh, I felt like Kadri individually is doing fine Sharon Govit or um, Kuzmenko on the power play is doing fine but when it's five on five like those guys unless it's an independent play by one or the other like there's just no cohesiveness between them and you know with Sharon Govich being back I would like to see the lines be shuffled a bit well let's talk about some roster changes and then we can talk about what how we might see those being shuffled how about that yes um so two two big I guess couple of lineup changes this week it was Sharon Govich activated from the IR back with the team. Um, he played in the Winnipeg game. I think he played all his minutes. I'd have to go take a look, but he's back with the team. Um, and Matt Coronado subsequently sent down to the American Hockey League. He didn't have to clear waivers, so I think it was the easy choice of who to send back. Uh, Hanzig is skating as well, so that's good to see that he might come back. And then Kevin Rooney came back this week as well, played one game, and has been out since. Uh, didn't look all that great. Kirkland has stayed in the lineup. So let's... Let's break these down one at a time. So Igor Sharangovich coming back. I mean, nothing but good news for the Flames, right? 
Yeah, and he had a number of good shot attempts um, in the Jets game and didn't get on the score sheet, but he was dangerous um, all night. Uh, I He's, felt he was playing with uh, Kadri and Kuzmenko. What do you think of that line? Um, I would like to see uh, Sharon Govich slid over to center because I th- felt that he played adequately last year as a center. Um, and like, ideally, I'd have Huberdeau on that line with Kuzmenko and him move Kadri down a line with Mantha and Pospisil and keep Zari, Backlund, and Coleman together. So not really, like, shuffling players out or up or down too far, but, you know, just... Out of the, the available options, Sharon Govich is kind of the only one that makes sense at center right now. Like, we've seen him do it. He can do it. It's not where I want him to be long-term, but while they're short of centermen, I think he's serviceable. Yes, exactly. And he's playing that position better than what Pospisil has brought. Uh, and I think that taking some of the pressure off of Pospisil to allow him to be the, you know, pain in the ass that we've seen him be uh, is better both for him and the team. I totally agree. And then uh, Coronado out, back to the Wranglers. I think you and I were, I don't want to speak for you, but I think we've talked about this. I think we both knew that this was coming. Like, you know, I think he was the odd man out. He was here. We've talked about Hanzig this way as well, but I think Coronado was here until Sharon Govich came back. And I think that's exactly why he was in the lineup. So I have no problem with him going to the American League. I don't think this is goodbye. I think it's so long and we'll see him soon. And, um, you know, he's, I have no doubt he's the first call up. Oh, for sure. And I think that it's important. You really had no other option. Yeah. And I, I feel that it's important for the Wranglers to continue their good start and be one of the elite teams in the AHL. So that way, like they can get playoff experience as well, because that will be important for the players that are down there. Like once they're actually legit NHLers and if they have winning experience in the A, they might be able to transfer that to the NHL instead of, you know, uh, waffling, uh, which we've seen in the past. And one thing I think, too, that we maybe don't count on enough there, too, is building chemistry with the guys you'll be playing with. I mean, you know, Peltier, um, Coronado, they're both the future of the Calgary Flames, right? So if you can go down there and you can put those guys in a lineup and they can build chemistry and then you can bring them up and they can continue to play well together. Like, I think there's something to be said about let them learn to play together, and maybe they'll be the maybe they'll be better than the sum of their parts. Yeah, and like if you look at the Wranglers start to the season, um, they are number one in the AHL out of all thirty two teams. Like they are literally number one, that's seven and one. And you know, learning how to be an effectively good team is very important for you know establishing more of a. Uh, longer term franchise you know uh, like you see teams that generally end up winning the stanley cup as they're developing like they're usually like developing as a very elite ahl team and learn how to win and those things do transfer as you move up and it's important for this team and having guys like coronado and hanzik down there learning like this is what it takes to be the best and when well, we've go. talked about right and it's i mean coronado is getting fourth line minutes on this team with sharon govich coming back he wasn't going to move up anywhere so playing fourth line minutes in the nhl i would rather he's playing first line minutes in the american league exactly you know who else i saw some people kind of criticizing this online i don't know who else you take out of lineup like that to me was the only possible option no, and realistically, the only guy that you could remove is Rooney, and Kirkland took his job. Yeah, or Klapka. But again, yeah. if you want to bring him up past the... I don't think you want to make a spot for Coronado on the fourth line. So who do you no. take out of the top nine? No, and like Coronado's game's not like Mangiapane, uh, who actually did benefit from playing that kind of greaser role on the fourth line with Hathaway. Like, it's not the same type of player. And like a guy like Pospisil would have benefited being on the fourth line in that spot if he was being freshly called up. Uh, but because, uh, like, Coronado does not have that two-way, you know, grinded-out edge to his game, he is more of a finesse scorer, 
it won't suit him well to be in that kind of role. No. I mean, okay, I could see a shuffle where maybe you take Klopp out, you put Poss on the fourth line, and you shuffle some guys around, like move Sharon Govich to center and put Coronado on the wing. But I, I think this is the right move. Yeah. And then with Hansi coming back, you and I talked about it a bit last week. I don't see him playing again for the Calgary Flames when he's healthy. I see him getting sent down to the American League. Yeah, and for most of the season, I, like I would be a little bit surprised if he's back before the trade deadline. Yeah, you, you want to build that chemistry. You want to get those guys going down there. I think you can definitely see him sent down there and, and play more down there and get, again, be a big fish in a small pond because, once again, where do you put him in your top nine, which is where he needs to be? Yeah. You know, do I think that, um, you know, Klapka is necessarily the best player? No, but I think Klapka is a fourth line player and he's playing, he fills the fourth line role very nicely. Yeah. And how would you say, uh, Klapka also doesn't really have a ton to learn in his role in the minors where having him play, uh, opposite Lomberg, as the teacher in this case will help him learn, okay, you know, if I'm going to be a full-time NHL or I have to crash and bang and be a pain just like Lomberg is every shift and finish my checks and get in there and get in on the other team to create havoc. And, you know, like he can do that in the AHL, but like, it's not really benefiting him. He needs to learn how to do that at the NHL level. And I feel like he's like 90% there. It's just learning the final 10%. What you can afford from to do on a fourth line. Exactly. And having a great teacher like Lomberg, like if Lomberg wasn't there, I would actually have preferred him to be in the A uh, to get a little bit more of it. But because he has a really good teacher there, uh, that, you know, and especially keeps him accountable every shift uh, that, you know, because Lomberg is always going, um, that, you know, it kind of drags him along too, saying that, you know, like, this is what you need to do if you want to actually be good in, in the NHL. Like, let's go. <laughs> exactly. Yep. For sure. You know, okay, kid, this is what it takes. Let's, let's go do this. Yep. And then the other guy that I guess to talk about is, as we mentioned earlier, Kirkland and Rooney. So Rooney started the season at the fourth line center. He got hurt. Kirkland's come in and played seven games. He has four points in seven games, one goal, three assists, five plus minus right now. It feels to me like, um, it feels to me like Kirkland has taken that job. Yeah. And you can see based on like any advanced stats that, the fourth line is generating more and like even on the eye test, like the fourth line feels more dangerous with him in the center spot. When Rooney was in there in the one game he played after the Vancouver game, like that fourth line was hemmed in their zone and like a lot of shots and scoring chances against in that one game. And I feel that Kirkland has that two way play enough with the other two guys crashing and banging to create a little bit of havoc and be in the right spots to generate shots and chances where, you know, you're, you just simply weren't seeing that with Rooney. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think Rooney, I think ideally you would put Rooney into the three C role if you could and keep um, Kirkland as the four C Rooney's not looking like a three C. I mean, I guess he's probably better than possible, but I think right now keeping Rooney as your 13th forward is probably where you need him. And, you know, some fans have forgotten Rooney's first year here was not that good. I mean, he got sent to the American League in his first year. Like, this is a guy who, since he's been a flame, has really, I would say, not shown. He's almost like Oliver Schilling in a way, right? He has some flash of brilliance. But in the end, he really hasn't shown a consistent NHL resume. Oh, and he's your prototypical... 12th, 13th forward. And, you know, like he basically gets in the lineup more because he's an actual center, especially on a team like this where, you know, like we're lacking in that regard. And, you know, full marks to Kirkland, who wasn't going to be the first call up if Cole Schwint was here, but he's taken that opportunity and he has ran with it, you know. And I mean, as Daryl Sutter used to say, you don't know when the opportunity is going to come, but make the most of the opportunity. Yep. And he every game he has been noticeable in a good way, 
Uh, very rarely does his line make mistakes when he's out there, and it, it's uh, basically the wrecking ball line. And, you know, it, you can tell, like, when they're out there, the Flames generally tend to get a little bit of momentum and boost from their havoc that they bring. And it's a good thing. And, you know, sometimes the other lines can be lacking a little bit, uh, but, you know, it, they seem to be the catalyst to turn things around, especially when the team's getting hemmed in their own zone for a while. Um, interesting to compare Cole Schwind. I'm just looking him up here. He's also played seven games, just as many as, uh, Justin Kirkland has. And he's seven games, zero goals, one assist and one point. So, I mean, if you kind of compare that they're playing in similar spots in the lineup, Kirkland is having more success than Cole Schwind right now. And Cole Schwind is on a better team. Yeah. Oh. Um, one player that I would like to bring up that, uh, I've found that he, seems to be struggling a bit this year is Blake Coleman. I I haven't really noticed him in a positive light at any point this season. Are you comparing and him to last season or are you comparing him to kind of his body of work? Body of work. Okay. Cause uh, last season I think was the anomaly for him. Oh yeah. It's sort of like Lance Boma's random 20 goal year that one time. Uh, but uh, yeah, like it, it, it's one of those that, he just seems to be a little bit behind the other two players on his line. And, you know, it, we've seen better from him since he's been a flame and it, it's just, uh, you know, now that like we're 10% through the season, you know, it, it's like he, he needs to be better. And, um, you know, his play on the penalty kill has been adequate, but not as good as normal. And like his passing and shooting has been, not really there um, to the same extent as normal. So just yeah. thought I'd bring that up. Yeah, I can see I can see where it comes from with him. If we're looking at a guy who's disappointed, I'd also throw Anthony Mantha in there. Uh, Mantha, I feel, is as advertised. He's been good for a few games, and then he's been invisible for a few games, and that basically has been Mantha's whole career. Where, like, That's when he's why on, he is where he is, yeah. playing for a one-year. Yeah, like when he's on, he's a game breaker, but uh, when he's not, um, you wouldn't even know he's in the lineup. Yeah, okay. I can see what you're saying about Coleman. like, And I, I think that Coleman does things. I think part of Coleman's value, from what I understand, is probably what he brings in the dressing room, too, that we can't see or can't measure with stats. He's a big part of leadership group here. And I think that's something that we need to, I don't know how we value that in stats, but I think there's more to Blake Coleman than what we see on the ice. Oh, I agree. It's just one of those where um, he's been noticeably lesser than he normally is. And, you know, like you see guys like Backland, and you can pretty much go through the rest of the lineup and like they're playing more or less where you would kind of expect them to. He's the only guy that has been like having expectations of a certain level of play and has been under that consistently. So it, it just a no, notable thing and something to keep an eye on as the season progresses. Yeah. And I mean, you know, he is one of the older guys, right? So I think at some point we knew that production was going to drop off. Maybe it's this year, who knows, but um, you know, yeah, I think we need to look at, We'll need to come back to this because ten, you know, ten percent of the season in, I don't know how you can assess if he's doing well or not. It might just take him some time to get going. Yep. Oh, I fully expect him to bounce back. It's just it's one of the few things I've noticed that's been well out of the norm. Like huberdo has been fine off and on, and like everybody else has been fine off and on, but he's the only one that's been a little bit lesser than. That that's makes all. Sense. So you're talking about kind of shuffling the line. So let's go through the four defense pairs. So on the first line, if we call this the Kadri Kuzmenko line now, which is Sharon Govich, Kadri Kuzmenko, what would that line look like for you? Uh, Huberdo up, Sharon Govich over to center. So it would be Huberdo, Sharon Govich, Kuzmenko? Yep. Okay, and Sharon Govich playing center there. That that makes some sense there. I mean, I know they kind of brought in Huberdo to play with Mantha, or Mantha to play with Huberdo, I guess. Um, I don't know if they're ready to break that up yet, but yeah, I could see that first line making sense. Then 
you've got your second line, which now is Zari, Backland, Coleman. I imagine you're putting Kadri there with who? No, I would no. just uh, leave that line as is. Okay, so then who do you put Kadri with? I would put move Pospisil over to the left side, have my Mantha on the right side, and Kadri in the middle. Okay, so it'd be uh, it would be Mantha, Kadri, and Pospisil on the line. That's an interesting line. Yeah, and, and I, I kind of would view them as all like the second line, all three. Okay. Like, like I would play them all equally. Like, it, I wouldn't delineate like any of them as like the first, second, or third. It just kind of does that, that mean line, the Lomberg line, line, line is still the fourth line if there's no third line, or do they yes. become the third line then? No, there's there's still the fourth line. This but. sounds like a you know a play. What is it? Three weddings and a funeral. You got three seconds and a fourth. Sounds mm-hmm. like somebody's draft year, but you've got three second lines and a very distinct fourth line. Yep. Um, so then obviously you keep Lomberg, Kirkland, and Klapka as your fourth line. Yeah, and substitute Rooney in if any of them struggle. Yeah, I could see that. I think an easier fix here might be, I mean, I think, the again, the team wants to keep Huberto Mantha together. I could see doing something simple where you move Postle onto the Kadri Kuzmenko line and yeah. then Sharon Govich to center the Huberto Mantha line. I wouldn't be surprised that's what we see in Vegas. Yeah, I could see that as well. Um, I so, just, I'm going, you know, especially with how Huberto started the year, like, I'd like to see if, like, he can keep up that kind of production. So like playing him mm. with better players and more consistent. Players. Well, I think giving him Kadri at the center will help with that too. Yes. So, um, I mean, if, if we do that, then the lines would become possible. Um, it would become possible. Kadri Kuzmenko. If we do that. And then Zari Backlund, Coleman, Huberto, Sharon Govich, Mantha. And I like the look of that line there. Um, even if you wanted to switch Kadri and Sharon Govich there, like I think you could swap those two centers. I'd be okay with that too. But I think with Sharon Govich coming back, we probably want to protect his minutes for a little bit. So I think putting him on what is now the third line with Huberto and Mantha makes some sense. And I think that's the easiest thing to do without disturbing any chemistry. Yep. The other uh, guy I think we need some credit here when we're talking about these is Connor Zari. Like he's playing like a, a grizzled veteran. I don't think this guy's ever going to be a hundred point a year guy or anything like that. But I think this is the kind of player that can be a heart and soul player for a long time. Yeah, I I view him as a guy that you could kind of expect to be like the 70, 80 point first slash second line, dangerous, can carry a line by himself uh, type of player. And how would you say, I do not believe like he'll ever be the guy um, specifically, but um, you need high-end secondary scorers as well if you're going to be a cup caliber team and like i view him as being like one of the elite secondary guys um yeah i don't even think he has to be a 70 80 point guy like i think um you know even if he does what he does now and he can be a good secondary line even getting 30 40 50 points a year i think he comes with so many attributes that he's the kind of guy you want to have in your lineup to he's kind of a chameleon he can play any role you need him to Yeah, and it's one of those where, like, realistically, like, if the Flames are eventually going to be a contending team, like, they need four or five guys that can be legit in and of themselves, and having Zari already there doing those things is very important because they won't need, you know, like, the the shopping list of, like, we need X, Y, Z gets a lot shorter with him already in the fold, and, you know... Like, especially assuming the Flames are picking in the top 10 this year, you're likely going to get another one via that pick. And, you know, you can build quickly through the draft that way. But, you know, having at least one guy already taking one of those spots is very important for this team moving forward. I agree. Um, Any changes you'd make to the back end? I'm liking that uh, them shifting certain guys in and out, uh, like having Miramanov be out for a game, having Bean be out every once in a while, like, you know, just shifting everybody. I feel that like three guys are clearly doing very well, and that's Ball, Anderson, and Uyghur. I view I'd those Bean as, to that too. I'd view those three guys as like your top three, period. And then, you know, plug and play the other three guys depending on how each one of them is doing at any given point. 
Yeah, I think Weger, Ball, and Anderson are, are your three of your top four. And then Bean, I think, is sort of slotted in on the last pair. And then you're moving Hanley, Mirmanov. I mean, you've got eight defensemen. So you've got Mirmanov, Hanley, and Barry, who are sort of, you know, trying to fill those last two. Yeah, and I, I want to say that Pahal has actually impressed and me Pahal really too. well um, throughout this season, and I'm actually viewing him as a potential top four guy moving forward. Um, like, he's ver- impressed me a lot defensively, and it, with some of his passing plays, like, it, it, there's more there than I had anticipated, and it'll be interesting to see like what his actual ceiling is because he's been really effective uh in his minutes it feels like joel hanley has been sort of stuffed in there more than maybe should have and i think he's barry's had an up and has had up and down nights but i feel like hanley just hasn't been impressive no hanley like in the last game against winnipeg he was there and he did his job effectively enough and there wasn't any hoopla with his game like he he filled in as an adequate number eight and you know like if he plays 10 15 games throughout the year as like the number six that's fine um i think that like there's no upside to his game like he is just the fill-in number six guy to you know sit other people uh when and if they need it yeah, um, I think I think Pahal, Mirmanov, and Barry need to be above him in the depth chart. Yeah, and Bean. I I really do view Hanley as the number eight. Yeah, I, I didn't say Bean because, like I said, I look at Bean as sort of having a spot in the bottom pair. Yeah, it's like a law firm, Bean and Company, or Bean and Partner, like you know Marley and Partner from uh, you know from Christmas Carol. Like I think it's Bean and whoever you put him with that night. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I think I think that's uh, I think he's a given there. And he, you and I talked about Bean going into the season, right? He's been in a market in Carolina where they didn't have a lot of room for him to grow defensively. And I think we're seeing now with giving him some time, he's looking good, and I think he's looking better than a lot of people thought he would. Yeah, and, and like even when he was with Columbus, like Columbus is kind of a tire fire anyway. Um, so it's hard to gauge anybody that plays there properly um and you know seeing him play well uh like to me he's been better than what shillington brought um considering he was basically shillington's replacement um not quite as flashy offensively as shillington was but definitely a lot more consistent defensively than shillington um he's struggled at times uh like there have been a couple of games where like his passing and like just lots of minor mistakes where like he'll lose the puck in his feet, that kind of thing. But he's recovered well enough where, you know, like it has, there haven't been too many, like, what are you doing <laughs> type plays, but you know, could be a little bit smoother overall, but, but that's you know. also what you expect from a bottom pair guy. Exactly. And, uh, to be honest, I, I view that, uh, the defense core as a whole has been significantly better than I was anticipating. I mean, and if you look at it, it looks like a lot of leftovers on paper, right? Other teams' leftovers and forgotten guys, but it's it's really been better than the sum of its parts. Yeah, and like I, I'm not viewing them as world beaters by any stretch, or you know, like being a top fifteen uh, defensive group, but they're not bad, and. I must say that uh, the player that has actually impressed me the most thus far to start the season has been Kevin Ball, and uh, I'm really growing to like him a lot, and uh, I view him as kind of like the anchor defensive defenseman for this team moving forward, and like kind of like Regeer Light, um, and it'll be interesting to see if uh, he can gain a little bit more physicality in his game, because if so, like he'll be a menace for this team a lot of expectations on him after the flames move their top goaltender at the time markstrom to get bring him in and you know not a lot of people were familiar with him or what he could do in his game but i think you know again showing that conroy in some you know knew what he was doing and knew who he wanted to bring in there to to make that work yeah and realistically not a big name but you know bringing in a good young talent yeah and realistically like this organization 
like any organization needs two really dynamite defensive defensemen and then the rest of the guys can be that two-way kind of thing but you like need anchors and getting Grushnikov and Ball uh who both you know embody the defensive side of the game very well I think you know like both of those guys will be anchors on this blue line in like the next five years as this team starts building to being a contender and getting those two anchors in the organization was a big deal and you know it'll be interesting to see how they balance the rest of the decor around them but it's good to see yeah ball keeps growing like this I think it'll be an understated trade Oh, I, I already view that one as a runaway win. Uh, getting the first round pick and um, ball uh, for a player that was expendable, in, given the flame situation with Wolf and Vladar. One also didn't want to be here, I don't think. No, and uh, an aged player, um, you know, like it, not no part of him continuing to be in the organization made sense for either side. So, like, I view the whole situation as a huge win for the flames and you know getting an anchor piece to your team you know and he's only 23 like that's a big effort as long as he stays here it'll be really good for the flames yes and i think he's an rfa this year so it's not like he's gonna get sniped i don't think even as good as he gets no one's gonna want to pay the off sheet price for him no and realistically like that this is the type of guy that you lock up for a long time at a okay cap hit like a six-year deal at four million per, and just you know, let her rip type of thing. Yeah, and I don't think we need to talk about the goalies because there's not much to change there in uh, no. in terms of goaltending. So you're not bringing Cooley up, you're not bringing anybody else up. So the goalies are locked in. Mm-hmm. Well, Matt, I think that's about it for what's happened this week for the Flames. Kind of a quiet week outside of gameplay. We'll see how the coming week comes, but. I want to remind everybody about what's going on next Sunday. One week from when we're recording this, you and I are going to be down at the Bow River Brewing Tap House during the Battle of Alberta game on Sunday, November 3rd. It's a 6 p.m. start. We're going to be hosting the Battle of Alberta trivia. This is the second trivia that we've done with our friends down there. We encourage everybody to come out, hang out, watch the game with us. It's a cool place to watch the game. Uh, They're going to have great specials all night. $6 for any pint of beer that they have on tap. And $13 for their pizza. They have some other things on the menu as well, but $13 for pizza. Pretty good deal. We'll be playing Battle of Alberta trivia during the first period intermission and the second period intermissions. First and second intermissions. We'll have two separate games of trivia. There will be a winner in each in each intermission, and the two winners will go head-to-head during the third period for the ultimate prize for the night. So even if you can't make it down in the first, come in the second. We cancel out all the points and it's a fresh game so don't feel like if i don't come i'm gonna be behind or anything like that you get a fresh game each period i think we're gonna have a lot of fun um it's always fun to watch us beat the oilers which i'm hoping we'll be able to do it's always fun to play trivia it's always fun to meet our fans you and i've had a number of events down there and we love fans we're starting to see the same people come down all the time i mean you know it's the same faces that seem to come join us so we hope they'll be there and we hope new people will be there too and i've had a few people ask so i just thought i'd Cover it on the show. Uh, yes, kids are allowed. You can bring your kids down if you want to. They're welcome to hang out. Obviously, they can't get $6 pints of beer, but um, they can have whatever else is on the menu there. I mean, Matt and I won't won't look, but yeah, don't get your kids beer. And also, uh, people have been asking, can I bring my friends? Of course. The more, the merrier. The more people we've got, great. You can play together. You can play on your own. You can hog all the glory, or you can pass to your line mates, whatever you want to do. But uh, I'm really looking forward to this. Yeah, and it was a lot of fun the last time we were there for the trivia night. Uh, it was a lot of fun recording the uh, draft show. Um, so they, it'll just and be, they take it, really good care of all of our fireside chat crew. Exactly, and it's a lot of fun. And what better game to watch than the Battle of Alberta? If you can't be in the building, the next best place to be is with us uh, having trivia night. That's right. So if you want some more details, go to firesidechat.ca. You'll see Battle of Alberta Trivia in the top navigation. Um, you can get the the date, the time, all that sort of thing from there. And also social media. We have it on our Facebook page, and I'll make sure that it's posted everywhere else this week as well. We hope you'll be there. It's a ton of fun. Um, great time to meet other Flames fans, too. I mean, we've had people that have met each other there. We've had fun there. They take really good care of us. Like you said, what a what a great place to be if you can't be in the building. And again, 
we mentioned it last week. There's not going to be esoteric questions. I'm not going to ask you who scored the second goal in the Battle of Alberta in 1993. Like, it's not going to be these weird stats geek analytics questions. There's going to be some questions everybody's going to know. There's going to be some questions that people who are, you know, old fans in the 80s will know. There'll be some some questions that fans of today are going to know. Like, we're making it so it's going to be accessible for everybody. So I probably shouldn't be giving a tip here. If you want to win, I would say bring a line that's got someone who knows the 80s, someone who knows the 90s, and somebody who knows the 2000s, and you have the best chance of, of winning the game. But, Matt, they didn't hear that from me. On what? Uh, uh, my recording cut out. I didn't hear that. That's right. It was just some voice on the internet. So come on out, Matt, and I'll be there the whole game uh, between the the uh, periods when the game's actually playing. We'll be watching hockey. We'll be hanging out with people. We'd love to chat. Uh, we love to take pictures with you guys. We love just hang out and and talk hockey and celebrate the Flames and where they're at right now. So we hope everyone will come out next Sunday. But before we get to Sunday, Matt, we got uh, some games we got to look ahead to. Yep. Somehow you've won two weeks in a row at our prediction game. Something has gone very, very wrong. I'm still trying to figure out how you're cheating. Yes, it's like multiple seasons worth of being correct in two weeks. Yeah. So we're we're three <laughs> weeks into the season. We weren't right in week one. Um, last week I thought we'd win Pittsburgh, lose Winnipeg, Carolina. You thought we'd win Pittsburgh, lose Carolina, Winnipeg. So you're up two nothing right now. So that means I've got to find a way to come back in this one. We've got a few games coming up uh, this week. Calgary Flames have a couple games coming up here. Going on the road again. First two on the road. Um, they are going to be going to Vegas on on Monday night to play an 8 p.m. start against the Vegas Golden Knights. Then their first trip to Salt Lake City to take on the Utah Hockey Club. That's still a weird name for me to say, the Utah Hockey Club. The Hockeyers at 7.30 p.m. on Wednesday. And then they are back here for a game on Friday against the New Jersey Devils and, Der- and uh, Jacob Markstrom, we were just talking about. And that's a 7 p.m. start time. So three games in the docket. Matt, why don't you go first? I think that they will be energized after the Winnipeg game, and I think that they'll beat Vegas. I think they'll beat Utah, and then I think they'll lose to New Jersey. If you're going to lose one, I'd rather lose to the East this week. This is a tough one for me. Like, I think they usually have trouble with Vegas. Yes. Vegas is a team that they don't often beat. I think that they're energized. I don't know. Vegas is a good team this year still. I'm going to say they lose to Vegas and they win the other two. Uh. So I think I think they'll win Utah. I mean, yeah, Utah looked good to start with. They're not looking all that good now. Well, they they still are the Coyotes after all. So, you know, not according to the NHL. According to the NHL media site, which I've been on, this is they do not carry over the lineage of the Coyotes. Okay, well. So officially, if you look at what the NHL says on the media site, the Coyotes franchise was disbanded, and this is a new expansion franchise that happened to purchase the assets. Yes. The hockey-related assets. So it's not like when you know Atlanta moved to Winnipeg or Atlanta moved to Calgary. It's a new franchise that just acquired the hockey assets. So, um, But I know what you're saying. It's still the same same people, same GM, same hockey people. Um yeah, I think I don't know. I want them to beat Vegas. I just they always have trouble with Vegas. Yeah, uh, we'll see. Um, it'll be interesting to see like uh, how this team responds to, after the Winnipeg game, because it, in years gone by, we've seen them you know fall flat on their face after a game ending like it did against Winnipeg, uh, and we struggle in Vegas anyway. So it'll be interesting to see if they can rebound. Um, It'll, to me, it gives me an idea of like what this team actually has in terms of mental fortitude. Uh, like after kind of getting robbed of a game, um, to see how they respond to that. Um, we'll see. It'll be interesting anyway. And then that's the big thing here. Like that's what we have to figure out is how do the Flames respond? The going's going to get tough. We know it's going to get tough as you play. You know, bad, good teams as you you know, take on injuries, all that sort of thing. It's definitely going to get tough. But yeah, I think it's a matter of how can this team mentally battle back from that and be ready and stay ready. And we know they can do it. I mean, they've shown us they can play this way. The question is, what does it take to keep them there? Mm -hmm. And I worry that, like you said, they could just spiral a little bit. They could just go down a, um, they, they could just go down a, a, 
they could go on a couple of game losing streak, right? They could just kind of spiral and kind of take pity on themselves and that sort of thing and go go on a bit of a pity party. And that's that's how you're going to lose more games this year. Yeah. You've got to stay mentally ready. Yeah. And it'll be interesting to see it. Like, and one of the other things I'm very curious is if they can maintain good play from the beginning puck drop instead of, you know, responding after the first period. Uh, like we've seen in most of the games this year, um, it'll be there. Are lots of little individual for the Flames to beat Vegas. They're gonna have to play sixty minutes consistent. They don't have to be the better team for sixty minutes. I don't think, but they have to play sixty minutes of consistent hockey. Yes, because yeah, they're they're generally coming out kind of flat. I mean, that's a a tale as old as time for the Flames. Not yes. playing in the first, and then you get in their act together in the second and third, and it's often too late. Mm-hmm. So we'll see what happens. Matt, I'm uh, looking forward to next Sunday when you and I will be hosting trivia, and I guess we'll see you then. Yep. And as always, go Flames, go. Fireside Chat is hosted by Dan Stevenson, co-hosted by Matt DeBorg. This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.